All right, well, it is noon and I think we will get started. If you are monitoring the chat, you'll see that um, Carla has dropped a link to a Google document. So if you're registered for CEUs or CPDUs, you can check in using that document. Otherwise, you're welcome to reach out directly to Carla. Um, she's showing up as E. Belzer today or to uh, Emily Ellen Harmon to uh, handle those. And there will be an opportunity at the end of the session as well if you need to register um, or sign in for those. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Kelsey Hasevoort and I am a research development specialist with the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois. I will be helping to host this webinar along with Corinne Cannavale, who is a graduate student in the neuroscience program at the university. I'd like to welcome all of you to the final webinar in our summer self-care series. This series is a collaboration between Illinois Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois, and is designed to connect those across the state with researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. If you have any questions during the program, please type them into the chat box. And if you are calling in, please hold your questions until the end of the session. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this series, Sania Lee Ganawi. Sania is a historian and a scholar of 19th and 20th century United States history, examining the intersections of gender and sexuality, medicine and media and technology, with an emphasis on the translational influence from Scandinavia. Her current doctoral work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign finds that sex education organizations in the US and Sweden shared sex instruction ideas and materials, which resulted in the integration of Swedish concepts, systems, and films into American sex culture. Today, she'll be talking to us about viral history, focusing on the Black Death, Spanish flu, and COVID-19. So I will hand it over to Sania. Wonderful, thank you. Well, um, as Kelsey just said, I am talking today about what I'm calling viral history, the back Black death, Spanish flu, and COVID-19. And I do want to start off by actually thanking Kelsey for inviting me to this presentation. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to end this um, summer of kind of a collection of uh, presentations that we've seen that have been fantastic. So today I'm going to talk about these three pandemics and elucidate on how pandemics in general have shaped global history. I pay special attention to the causes and spread of pandemics and the impact that they had and continue to have particularly on vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Oh, let me see, my slide's not moving. One second. Do it down here, there we go. So I'm currently working on my PhD in history at the University of Illinois. I am a cultural historian and with a focus on the history of medicine and sexuality. My background is actually in media studies and media history. Um, and I say this because I want to be clear about something. I am neither an epidemiologist nor am I a scientist. And I probably should add to that I'm also not a medical doctor. And so my presentation today might be a little different than some of the other presentations we've seen this summer. I'm really coming at this from a cultural historical point of view to look at how pandemics have impacted people, how people have responded to pandemics. I'm not really going to talk about the microbiology of these pandemics, for example. That's kind of not what I'm doing. Um, I'm trained as a historian, and my research is very much firmly rooted in the humanities. Now, one of the many reasons I'm actually thrilled to be here today is because I very much value cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary conversations. And so even though my own work is not based in the sciences or the social sciences, I very much see the value in having these conversations uh, between and amongst STEM researchers, and then those, those people who, like myself, were firmly kind of rooted in the humanities. So I want to kind of, some of you may be kind of better equipped to talk about the epidemiology behind these pandemics, but I want to focus kind of more on their cultural impact and how we, in, you know, in the middle of COVID-19 are still dealing with pandemics. Now, there, are, there obviously have been many pandi pandemics in the history of the world. I could have talked about a good number of them, but I chose to focus on these three pandemics for several reasons. Now, first, there are actually many similarities among these pandemics and how people responded to them. Um, obviously, we're still going through the COVID-19 pandemic, so the responses by uh, politicians, leaders, physicians, and you know, common everyday people 
have changed and continue to change. So my comments today, particularly on COVID-19, are not in any way final. But we can see threads that link these three pandemics and how people in particular responded to them. Secondly, I feel that uh, the other two pandemics, that the Black Death and the Spanish Flu, are the ones that you oftentimes see journalists and commentators now really comparing COVID-19 to, particularly the Spanish Flu. So as such, I thought it would be imperative for us to criti critically examine these comparatives and learn a little bit more about the Black Death and Spanish Flu so we can really examine why these comparisons are valid or invalid. I do also want to say when I focus on the Spanish flu and COVID-19, I want to acknowledge my own perspective. Um, I am a U.S. historian, so I'm coming at these pandemics um, from the perspective of a U.S. historian. They were all global events. They can obviously COVID-19 continues to be a global event, but for discussion and comparison, um, in particular, I will talk about Spanish flu and COVID-19 from the context of American history. I want to acknowledge the Medieval Academy of America in my talk today, um, particularly with a focus on the Black Death. So I'm a historian of medicine, but my focus is on the modern, modern period. I focus predominantly on the 20th century. And so you'll see this when I talk about the Spanish flu. That one I know. Um, I'm not a medievalist, and so my approach today is really come, coming from the lens of history of medicine. Um, I would encourage all of you to reach out to medieval historians uh, for a more in-depth analysis of the Black Death and, learn, and to learn more about it, particularly if you're interested in the connections between the Black Death and COVID-19. The Medieval Academy of America earlier this year had a huge um, online webinar that they hosted really looking at the new research that medieval historians have conducted in the last five to ten years with a focus on the Black Death. So, that is a valuable tool and I recommend uh, checking out their website. Now, while the Black Death was not the first pandemic, its impact was enormous. And so I really um, kind of want to talk about why the Black Death became to be known as the plague and why we still kind of talk about that today. Um, in the question and answer portion, I'm happy to talk more about the work of historians and how we approach uh, our discipline and what does it mean to say when I say I'm a historian of medicine or I study uh, pandemics, what exactly does that mean? So to understand how the Black Death came about, one thing you have to understand is what happened at the time, what people were going through. And there was a huge famine that existed in Europe and Eurasia and Africa at the time. And this is a poem from 1321 that I'm going to read to you. And I would really like you to pay attention to the first two lines of this poem. It says, when God saw that the, that the world was so, so overproud, he sent a dearth on earth and made it full hard. A bushel of wheat was at four shillings or more, of which men might have had a quarter before. And then they turned pale who had laughed so loud, and they became all docile who before were so proud. A man's heart might bleed for to hear the cry of poor men who called out, alas, for hunger I die. Now the first two lines are important because they really talk about the relationship between religion and people at that time. Now the world was actually going through a warming period, and, but people didn't, you know, at the time they didn't know they were going through a warming period. There was a lack of rainfall, and we even have documentation that people had to turn to eating their domestic animals because they were so hungry. But to reconcile with this, they often turned to God to try to explain what was happening. And this is important because you have this famine in the early part of the 14th century that people were already very malnourished, very ill, and they were looking for a reason. They were looking for the why. Why is this happening? And they turned to God to kind of respond to that and say, well, okay, well, God must have pun is punishing us for some reason or he must, something must have happened. So please keep that in mind as we kind of go into the Black Death. We already have malnourished bodies and we already have people kind of questioning their faith and their status uh, in the world and how this, how this vast famine could have happened. Until recently, a lot of historians, scholars and epidemiologists have argued that the Black Death peaked between 1346 and 1353. <clears throat> and as you can see from this map right here, those are kind of the two dates that are given at the start and end dates. And you can also see the movement of the Black Death. Pay, please pay particular attention. You can see that the early uh, references to the Black Death are actually on the sea. And that is important because we'll talk about trading in a minute. But we have sea trading going on. And then you can kind of see the movement. It comes uh, into what is now Western Europe and then up north into Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and then into the Western part of Russia. So this is kind of the general peak that we kind of look at. And then, as I said, the trading becomes very important. 
uh, there's massive training going on at this time. Um, and in particular, Genoa and Venice, two cities in Italy, become uh, hard hit because of the Black Death. They are um, huge commercial trading ports. And you can see the trade that happens here. Most of them come out of either Venice or Genoa and then go around to what we what identify as modern day Turkey and Greece, and then kind of go back and up into Northern Europe. Now these two maps, this one that kind of gives the start and end dates, and then this one that gives the trade routes are not wrong, but they are incomplete. And what I mean by that is uh, many historians have agreed that the regions ravaged by the Black Death, the regions that you see here, saw around 30 to 40 percent mortality. Um, and they think the numbers that resulted from the deaths of the Black, of the Black Death were around uh, 75 to 200 million people. The problem with that is it's actually incomplete because it does, doesn't take into account what we'd identify as modern day Asia and then now Africa as well. So scholars have started to expand their research to really focus not only on that seven year period that is considered the peak of the Black Death, but to really look before and after that and also look how uh, geographically there was much more movement than what we just see in modern day Europe. And so what a lot of uh, medieval historians now I call the second plague pandemic probably began in the 13th century, so around 46 years before the commonly given date of 1346, and lasted in different and modified forms until the 1500s. And so we're talking, you know, over 100 years on and off of this pandemic spreading across the globe. Uh, historians do believe that the Black Death touched nearly half of the inhabited world. And the pathogen that caused the Black Death, uh, it's Yersinia pestis, continued to actually cause outbreaks well past this 1353 end date. And so as you can see here, um, historians now believe that the first kind of dispersion of the pandemic started with this light blue line. And then we have the 14th century one that a lot of historians have already focused on, but the focus has been on modern day Europe. And actually what we now know is that it, um, the plague really did spread into Africa as well in both to the Eastern and Western coast of Africa and up to in modern day Russia as well. And then you see another kind of wave or bout of dispersion that occurs with this pink line um, right here. So to the best of our knowledge, only the Americas, Australia, and Oceania did not actually encounter the Black Death. Now, one aspect that oftentimes you will see people talk about with the Black Death is issues of masks. And you'll see this bird beak-like mask quite often. We actually know that did not happen. Um, even though some people associate it with it, there's no evidence that people wore these types of masks. They came much, much later, several hundred years later. Um, and it's also too important to understand people didn't know what caused the Black Death at the time. And so these masks that come into play later on uh, really were about um, prohibiting the entrance of smells into the nasal passages. A lot of people believed that bad smells cause disease. And so if you weren't able to inhale the bad smells, you weren't able to inhale disease. And so um, in the 18th century, for example, when they would wear these beak-like masks, they would oftentimes put items in the beak, so rose petals, for example, or something to kind of mask the smell so you would not inhale the smell. But we do know that happened several years later. So if you ever see this association with the Black Death, it is actually incorrect. However, as was common during the Middle Ages, people often attributed the plague to supernatural forces and the wrath of God. So like I said, we saw this with famine and we see it again with the plague. The medieval church was a very prominent force during this time. However, the continued spread of the plague really caused the church to lose its power significantly. Um, people just could not understand how God was able to cause so much death and destruction. There was kind of a questioning of the faith, and this eventually will contribute to the splintering of unified Christian worldview, which leads to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Um, I do want to be clear, I'm not saying the Black Death was the only reason for the Protestant Reformation, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it was one building block, you could say, that really leads to questioning of the church and questioning of God. Now, there have been other pandemics that have happened since the Black Death, but really to the one to the same scale that we associate it with is actually now the Spanish flu. So before I go into the Spanish flu, I actually want to get your takes, because I want to make some comparisons between the Spanish flu and COVID-19. 
So in the last five, six months that we've really been in the heat of, of COVID-19, what are some of the cultural changes that you have witnessed or experienced since COVID-19 started? And please feel free to put your answers in the chat. No sports, yes. No big groups, yep, staying home. People cocooning, I like that, cocooning in your homes. A lot of social distancing. Masks, yes. No weddings or funerals. The lack of physical touch, that's important, yes. In this video teleconferencing, yeah, we, I think we're all getting a little Zoom exhaustion, but I hate to tell you, I think we're gonna be here for a while with the Zoom. Yes, lots of Zoom. Excellent. So please continue to put your comments in the chat, but maybe you can kind of also follow along and see what people are, um, you know, kind of commenting and then how they're actually uh, perhaps coping with some of the COVID-19 um, issues that you're coming about less. Um, and you know, what, what kind of some of these you can see maybe that will relate to what I'm going to talk about with um, the Spanish flu. So in August 1918, a Norwegian freighter entered New York Harbor. The freighter had 10 flu cases and four people had actually already died at sea. Now New York City's health commissioner, who was already aware of cases of the flu that had appeared in the United States, the first few cases of Spanish flu, they didn't know it was the Spanish flu, but first few cases of flu appeared in March of 1918. So this is August of 1918. And the health commissioner, when he sees this Norwegian um, freighter coming into the harbor, he sees the ill passengers, he sees that uh, crew members have already died. He says, quote, there is no reason for alarm, end quote. And he decides against quarantining the crew. Two days later, another steamship enters the port. This time it has 21 ill passengers and five people had died at sea. A different person, this time the uh, port's chief surgeon, said that the flu that, you know, that we were seeing that was spreading across the globe was, quote, not at all dangerous, and the less the whole subject is agitated, the better it will be for New York and the whole country, end quote. Uh, both of these men proved to be very, very wrong. So to understand kind of what caused the Spanish flu and how it spread, you have to keep in mind that the United States and the war is actually currently in, in the world, excuse me, is currently in World War I at this time. So while the famine was a component of the Black Death, in 1918, the Spanish flu kind of, World War I influenced how the Spanish flu um, spread and influenced some social and cultural factors. So a little brief history lesson, World War I started in 1914 and the United States formally entered the war in April of 1917. So the world had been in global conflict for approximately four years before the first ever case of Spanish flu was formally recognized. So there was already kind of a global exhaustion. You had mental exhaustion, you had physical exhaustion, you had men, predominantly men, who were fighting in the war, who were literally in trench warfare. And because of the war, in some cases, you also saw famine and malnutrition as well. So it's important to keep in mind that at this state, the global bodies were already very weak. There was already an, a general exhaustion among the globe. Now I say that, that didn't stop Americans from playing baseball. They can't give up their American pastime and even through the Spanish flu, they played baseball. And I find this amusing, particularly now during COVID-19, when you see baseball and you see the, either the cardboard cutouts in the stand or you see the uh, kind of virtual, um, audience members that are at the baseball game. So the America's pastime will continue through numerous pandemics, apparently. Um, that being said, I don't want to be facetious. This was indeed a very deadly pandemic. Around 500 million people, or approximately one third of the world's population, became infected with the virus, um, and it killed anywhere between 20 to 50 million people. So this was hugely deadly. Um, in the United States, around 30 million people became infected, which was just under one third of the US population. So one third, almost one third of the country became sick with the flu. 
and around 675,000 people died. Um, now it's important to remember 675,000 people died. We're looking at a time when the uh, approximate population of the United States is only around 100 million. The Spanish flu was so deadly that it actually dropped the life expectancy of people across the globe. Now this uh, chart you're seeing right now is just the life expectancy of people in the United States. But if you look right here in 1914, 1915, the average uh, lifespan for a man was around 52 years. For a woman, it was a little, for women, it was a little closer to 57. We see a little bit of drop. Um, part of this can be attributed to World War I, and we, we see the impacts of that happening, even though the United States had not formally entered the war, that by 1916, men's life expectancy was around 49 years, women were around 54. And then the Spanish flu hits. And in 19, at the end of 1918, the life expectancy for men was around 36.6 years. And for women, it was around 42.2. Um, as you can see, it does go back up when uh, the Spanish flu kind of, when we get a hold on the Spanish flu a little bit, but it was a very, very deadly pandemic. So I briefly want to go through a little bit of the timeline to talk about how the Spanish flu spread and what we can kind of learn from it. And so one of the first cases of the Spanish flu in the United States occurred actually in Fort Riley, Kansas. It was a military base. And within a number of weeks, the flu cases uh, just skyrocketed. You have to remember that people, and particularly in military bases, were in close quarters and so easily spread across the country. It's also important to remember, like I said, that um, the United States is at this point is in the war. And so hundreds of thousands of soldiers are going back and forth each month as they're deployed to World War I. They're on boats in very close quarters. In September 1918, this is kind of when we hear about the second wave, or perhaps you've heard about the second wave of the Spanish flu was most deadly. That is accurate. Um, it starts in September 1918. The second wave we kind of identify emerged um, uh, in Boston and it just explodes across the country. And so as you can see here, these are police officers who are masked up as they go out, I guess, on patrol. So some of the impacts that happened with the Spanish flu, maybe some of these might found a, sound a little familiar right now. So there was a shortage of nurses and medical personnel. Uh, they had temporary and or makeshift morgues. The number of bodies became so large that hospitals and morgues could not handle them anymore, and so they had to find other alternatives to store the bodies. There was closing of public spaces, the prohibition of large gathering, there was um, mask requirements in certain places, and then there was a loss of labor as well. So there was also an economic impact that came about because of the Spanish flu. In November 1918, World War I formally ends. And uh, oftentimes we call that 11-11-11 because World War I formally ends on November 11th at 11 a.m. Paris time. And so, you know, great celebration, the world is over, but you, now you have to get all these soldiers back into the, into the United States. And so this is how they get them back in the United States. Um, there are no masks. There are uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers on ships that are just coming back into the United States in very close quarters. So you can imagine what happens when you have this, this number, sheer number of people together who are now um, entering the United States. Um, in January 1919, we kind of see what is the third wave and it's not as bad as the second, but it's still somewhat significant. And um, it's also important to remember that by this time, you, people are coming out of a war, there's just an overall continued exhaustion. There's still lack of uh, nurses and lack of kind of care of actually how to handle this. And then in April 1919, uh, President Woodrow Wilson is in France to uh, work on the peace treaty, the formal peace treaty for the end of World War I, and he actually collapses. Um, we don't know for sure that he had the Spanish flu, but historians do speculate that he did indeed. There are um, notations that he had anywhere from 101 to 103 degree Fahrenheit temperature. And there is also a little bit of documentation that he perhaps was experiencing some type of delusions. And that was actually one um, component of the Spanish flu, particularly if you were quite ill, you would have hallucinations or a brief period of delusions. And he actually supposedly had that um, in April of 1919. So like I said, that one of the first formal documentations of the Spanish flu in the United States occurred in Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, the origins of the Spanish flu are unknown. There are several theories positing that the flu started in the United States, the UK, France, or China. Um, one theory in particular argues that the flu actually spread among soldiers in Europe 
potentially months before the first formal documentation of the flu. Um, I mentioned this, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. This is an image from that military base because for the, a decent amount of time, historians and scientists have actually thought maybe this was the start of the Spanish flu. Um, and you will see this theory kind of pop up now and again because of just the vast numbers of flu cases that occurred in Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, like I said, it's a military base, so you have a high number of soldiers that are in very close quarters. Um, World War I also contributed to the naming of the Spanish flu. Now, for the record, the one thing that most people are pretty sure of, it actually did not start in Spain at all. So why is it called the Spanish flu? Well, as often happens during wartime, um, issues of censorship and restrictions on a free press begin to tighten. And we, see, we still see this to modern day. It happened in the United States with the Iraq war in the early 2000s. Sometimes it's self-censorship by journalists and news organizations. Sometimes it's actually uh, censorship that comes from the government where they put into different um, legislation that can restrict what the press is and is not allowed to print. And we see this happen during World War I. So the United States and European governments in particular really minimized the number of infections and deaths that the press could report. So in other words, the governments uh, did their best to downplay concerns over the spread of the flu. Now, Spain, however, remained neutral during the war. And so newspapers in that country freely reported on the status of flu in Spain. So as such, on paper, it appeared that Spain somehow had more cases than other countries um, or that they were somehow experiencing the flu worse than other countries. And it created this false idea that Spain was somehow the start of the Spanish flu. And so thus we have the connections between the number of cases in Spain and then the spread of the flu. It really, the Spanish flu and the naming of that had absolutely nothing to do with the legitimate number of cases in Spain or the origins of the flu. It wasn't if Spain was somehow worse off than other countries. It just happened to have a free press. And so the press openly reported on the status of flu at that time. Now, there we go. Um, so initially when realizing what we now call the Spanish flu was in the United States, the US government basically did nothing. And then when they did something, they actually lied about it. And what I mean by that is the government said that this Spanish flu was like every other flu and that people did not need to do anything special. And we can see that here. This is an article from the New York Times. Now this is December, 1918. We are very much into the, the waves of the Spanish flu. And the New York Health Commissioner basically says, no, nope, don't worry about it. Influenza is not going to happen here. We, it, the cases are just sporadic here and there. You don't need to worry about it. So propaganda during and after World War I really delayed actions that could have prevented the spread of this virus. And the Spanish flu really quickly spread um, in many different types of places. So again, some of these may sound familiar. So for example, police officers became sick, and this is kind of a, a cheeky little title that the policemen failed to arrest Spanish flu, basically to say that the uh, policemen became ill with the Spanish flu. We know that politicians also became ill. So I mentioned Woodrow Wilson and he collapsed in April of 1919, but even before that, we know that politicians in the United States became ill with the flu. The flu spread in um, jails and prisons. Again, you have people who are in very close quarters who are next to each other, who are not wearing masks. And so you see the spread of the flu in prisons. And we see nurses and medical practitioners um, become ill as well because they are constantly exposed to the flu. At the end of 1918, the Journal of the American Medical Association said that the year would be remembered for two reasons the end of World War I and the new battle against the flu. And so the AMA wrote, 1918 has gone, a year momentous as the termination of the most cruel war in the annals of the human race, a year that marked the end, at least for a time, of man's destruction of man. Unfortunately, a year in which developed a most fatal infectious disease, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of human beings. Medical science for four and one half years devoted itself to putting men on the firing line and keeping them there. Now it must turn to its whole, now it must turn with its whole might to combating the greatest enemy of all, infectious disease. And the Spanish flu became so ubiquitous that there were actually little jumping rope rhymes that uh, people played with, that little children played with. And so this is one, um, it says, I had a little bird, its name was Enza, I opened the window and in influenza. 
Um, and now I will admit I've yet to hear any jumping rope rhymes to COVID-19. So if, if you want a little homework assignment, you can go and write your own jumping rope rhyme to COVID-19 and we can talk about it in relation to the Spanish flu. One thing that people learned uh, very quickly and very early on was that to combat the Spanish flu is you had to wear masks. And that if you wore masks, it actually helped a little bit. And so this is, you can see this photo here is a group of people. Um, you can see the sign right here that this woman is wearing that says wear a mask or go to jail. I do want to highlight this woman is in the middle is not wearing her mask properly and needs to cover her nose as well. But you had people who were advocates for mask wearing who knew that it um, stopped the spread of the flu and who said that people needed to wear it as often as possible and wherever you go. Um, I also just want to point out that the masks became a form of fashion in a way. Um, so this is a photo from London of people wearing masks to protect themselves against the Spanish flu. And as you can see, they're a little different. They're more, more cone-like and cone-shaped, but they still cover the nose and mouth as well. And so be it became, I don't want to call it a fashion trend because it wasn't that by any means, but it became a, a way to kind of express your identity in, in, in an odd way. Um, in the days before, uh, you know, YouTube and Etsy, you had to actually tell people how to make masks and how to properly well them, wear them. And so newspaper articles did that. And as you can see that here, um, talking about this is a how-to of how to make the masks. And so they should be large enough to cover the nostrils and the mouth. You can fasten the tape and use elastic to adjust them so it actually fits around your head properly. You can see here on the far right, there is a photo of a woman who shows how the mask is supposed to be worn. And then it also right here in the middle, it tells you where you're supposed to wear masks. So in any store, office, factory, public building, theater, church, streetcar, basically anytime you're not in your home, um, you need to be wearing your mask. Now, not everyone actually agreed with this. Um, and you see that people were charged for not wearing to, uh, for failing to wear their masks properly. They, you know, had them around their neck or something. And in this case, um, uh, people were arrested because they were not wearing their masks properly and they were fined $5, which was a, a decent sum of money at that time. And so while there was never any federal or formal mask mandate, we do see cases of where local police officers or local police agencies will kind of take over and charge people for not wearing their masks properly. And some people basically said no. And so we do see a group of anti-maskers kind of emerge during the Spanish flu. They have their own meetings and formal uh, gatherings where they talk about why they don't want to wear masks, why they don't think they're helpful and why they refuse to do so. Uh, one of the main um, kind of concerns that the anti-mask people put forward was that they thought that them wearing the mask would actually be harmful, that some, that the Spanish flu would get on the mask and then you would put the mask on your face and that thus it was actually more harmful to wear a mask. So they just said they weren't going to do that. So how did cities respond and how did it end? Well, um, it's important to note that, like I said, there was no federal response to the Spanish flu. And so what ended up happening is you had different states and cities have to take over control of how they were going to, to combat the Spanish flu. The problem with that is without any federal response, it's very sporadic. So what happens in one part of the country, you know, might not happen in another part of the country. Yet people were still moving within the United States. And so you would go from an area that had perhaps tight restrictions to an area that had next to zero restrictions yet you're still moving, the virus is still moving as well. And so without a federal response, we see, um, we can kind of focus and see what happens in different cities and states. So for example, in Philadelphia, uh, the officials there basically said the Spanish flu was just like a normal flu and that people did not need to be worried about it. Um, in the fall of 1918, they even had a parade in Philadelphia, which tens of thousands of people attended. Now, 10 days later after that parade, 1,000 people in the city had died and 200,000 became ill. Um, it was only after that major outbreak that the city decided it was time to shut down public spaces. St. Louis, for example, had actually quite an opposite response. They, early on, the people in St. Louis closed schools and movie theaters. They shut down any type of public entertainment. And even at its highest, St. Louis had one-eighth of the mortality rate that Philadelphia had. The Spanish flu basically ends um, because there's widespread infection. And I don't mean this facetiously, but you either got the flu and you died, 
or you developed immunity or you were never exposed to it to begin with, at least to your knowledge, you were never exposed to it. Um, there was never a formal kind of um, introduction by the government to, to stop the Spanish flu. It just kind of worked its way out. And that's one reason it lasted uh, so long for almost two years. In 2008, researchers uh, identify what they think kind of why the Spanish flu was so deadly, what caused it. And what they think is that actually a group of genes in the virus uh, somehow mutated and it made it uh, possible to wink, uh, weaken, excuse me, weaken the bronchial tubes and lungs, thus increasing the chance of bacterial pneumonia. So not only did you get the flu from Spanish flu, but you also got bacterial pneumonia as well. And that was just too much for bodies to take. So where does that leave us today? Well, obviously we are in the middle of a global pandemic and I'm hoping you can see some of the similarities between what I've already talked about with the Spanish flu and what now is happening with COVID-19. Um, some of the things that we've already kind of seen, a shortage of nurses and medical personnel, we've seen makeshift morgues during COVID-19, the closing of public spaces, which a lot of you commented on in the chat as well, the prohibition of large gatherings, some of you also commented on the mask requirements. Um, there's been an economic factor. And we've also kind of seen some of the same things that happen. We've seen politicians become ill. We've seen police officers become ill. Um, we've seen the spread of COVID-19 in federal prisons. And obviously, there is, not obviously, but there is um, uh, a group of anti-maskers who basically say, no, we're not going to wear this. I do want to briefly address um, something that I think is important to understand that um, with COVID-19, it adds to the history of a long uh, time of, particularly in the United States, of equating pandemics and disease with other issues of quote unquote foreign or um, foreign countries and immigrants. The result of this is very, very racist rhetoric. Um, during the Spanish flu, for example, immigrants from Southern Europe, including parts of Spain, um, experienced racism and ethnic prejudice in the United States. Coming at the end of World War I, where Germany was quote unquote the enemy, you saw anti-German sentiment as well that was happening. And during the Spanish flu was also the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this was an act that prohibited immigrants of Chinese laborers um, from entering the country. And one aspect used to support this uh, was that uh, Chinese people or people from Asia were somehow carriers of disease. Uh, this rhetoric is based in a long history of white supremacy in the United States. It's racist rhetoric. And unfortunately, we continue to see people in power use this rhetoric today to blame and to place blame on other peoples and to deflect um, any type of responsibility. So I do um, want to end by kind of talking a little bit about the numbers. Um, now, I took this screenshot from Johns Hopkins University on Sunday. Um, I do know today that global cases are actually already over 20 million, so these numbers are not entirely accurate. But as of Sunday, we had global cases around 20 million, global deaths approaching 100,000. And then the United States itself is currently accounting for around one quarter of uh, global cases of COVID-19. And then we are unfortunately fastly approaching almost 200,000 deaths. So, this truly is a global pandemic as well. And I noticed with some of the other presentations we saw this summer, there were people who were saying, what are your action items? How can we end this by talking about what we can do? And I think my action items would be stuff you've already heard, but that is to stay home, um, wear your mask and practice social distancing when you do need to go out and make sure that you actually do get tested if that's available to you. Um, and that is actually how I'm ending my talk today, but I'm happy to talk about more. And I thank you for coming. If you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to share uh, a link to you guys for our post um, post session survey. Uh, this is going to be a really important one for you guys because um, we are looking forward to planning some uh, seminars in the future in the fall and spring. Specifically, we're looking to talk about um, genetics, some other aspects of health. Uh, we got a lot of questions about uh, microbiome and um, we're kind of hoping to, hoping to expand upon what we've done this series. So definitely fill out that um, Qualtrics survey. Make sure you get your um, your suggestions in for what you'd like to see in the future. 
Um, and Sunia, it looks like we have a question. Um, did the Spanish flu infect humans from animals? From We don't actually 100% know that. Um, there are kind of discussions about where it actually originated and how it, um, to my knowledge, we don't really know yet. So that one I can't answer. Okay. And do you know if there were countries that did a better job than the United States at handling the Spanish flu? Um, I think that's, to answer that really kind of you have to look at broader uh, issues of social welfare in other countries. This is coming in the early part of the 20th century and so a lot of, uh, particularly now when a lot of the United States is being compared to uh, countries in Europe, for example, a lot of those social welfare systems that we currently see were not in place yet. And so a lot of those came out about in the 1930s and 1940s. So this is very much after uh, the Spanish flu came about. And so you do see a little bit that happens, particularly when you see a federal response to it, but this, particularly at the time, people really didn't know how to combat it, combat that. And um, because there were so much, there were so much issues of propaganda and the politics that were involved becoming out of World War I, that you really actually saw a lot of issues of censorship that was happening in other countries as well. So it wasn't just the United States where this was happening. Um, like I said, because Spain was, uh, they did not, they were neutral during the war, they were very open with what was happening in there. And so Spain is kind of a good country to see kind of what happened and how they dealt with it. But unfortunately, at the time, it wasn't that some country was, quote unquote, better or handling it better than the United States. It really was a very deadly global pandemic. And uh, I guess to that question, um, what are some trends of uh, other places in the world right now that are doing a better job to control COVID-19? That other countries are doing right now for yeah. COVID-19? Um, so like what are some things that are happening that are, are improving the outcome in these yeah. uh, countries? Uh, I think one, I would direct your attention to actually what's happening in New Zealand. They actually just had their first case in I think 102 days, um, something like that. Um, but what they're actually doing is they had, and we see this, they had a federal response. Their prime minister basically shut down the entire country. They did not allow movement among cities. They um, shut down um, all schools and that kind of thing. And so you see that because there was a federal response, there's less likely of transmission among city to city to city, which is what we saw, for example, with the Spanish flu, that it went from city to city to city because people were moving down. And so um, it also, if you have kind of a federal response to it or a, a na national response, you're not, you don't have to fight for resources. And so resources such as PPE or testing really goes to where it's needed. It's not in what happened in the United States where states fought against states. Another thing that I think is important that um, South Korea did, and we saw this with New Zealand, and then that's happening in some of the Scandinavian countries, there was really a focus on contact uh, testing and tracing. And what that means is you go and continually, you get tested numerous times, um, and that if you have, in this case, COVID-19, you really focus on who were you in contact with, who has, um, where, what, where did you physically go? Did you go to the grocery store? And then you literally trace your movements to find out who else you infected. The problem with that is you need to have reliable testing and you need to have, have it happen quickly and you need to have it accessible. So if it's costing a lot of money and people can't get it, for example, they're not going to go get tested. And so um, contact tracing is important and uh, having that federal response where you can control um, briefly kind of people's movements to stop the movement of, of the COVID-19 or the Spanish flu. Thank you. Um, and this is something you might not have the data accessible for you right now, but maybe we can share this information after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, but Michelle is interested in comparing where the Spanish flu was around five months in, in comparison to what we're seeing now with COVID-19. And I don't know how, how oh. sensitive, I guess, the data would be at that point. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't have numbers off the top of my head. I do know that what you probably heard some, you maybe heard in the last five months with COVID-19 is that people were saying, oh, the Spanish flu, it lightened up. It wasn't as bad during the summer. And that was true. So the first wave that we saw was uh, February, March, kind of April. It, did, it didn't go away, but it, it wasn't as bad during the summer months. And then it came back more in September. And so five months in, I, uh, I, hypo I don't know for sure, but I hypothesize the numbers for COVID-19 are uh, pr probably proportionally are going to look worse because you really didn't have any type of 
break, quote unquote, that happened during the summer where they did with the Spanish flu. And so the worst part, um, like I mentioned, happened of Spanish flu happened in the autumn of 2018. So that's the September through November, December. So those months for the Spanish flu, that's when it really hit hard. But the actual numbers, that's a great question. I don't have those off the top of my head. And um, do you know where, where schools open during the Spanish flu? How was education handled? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes and no. Um, in the United States, that really depended on kind of where you went. So um, in a lot of the major cities, including Philadelphia and New York, they actually let, they kept schools open um, and you went to them and it really wasn't um, impacted. And I should kind of also clarify too, one thing that we noticed with the Spanish flu, which as of right now is not happening with COVID-19, was that the Spanish flu really impacted younger people. And so uh, age groups 20 to 40 um, really were impacted hard by the Spanish flu and mortality was high. And so there was um, um, a focus perhaps on young people. Now, St. Louis, for example, like I mentioned, they actually shut down. And so unlike Zoom and whatnot, you, you kind of just really didn't go to school. There was a very a different approach to it than what we're kind of doing now. You, um, you just didn't do it. What you, you did happen and what you saw happen with Spanish flu is what I'm kind of calling the start and stop approach where maybe there was a shutdown for a little bit and people didn't go to school or you, you know, public gatherings were closed and then they started those back up again. And then the, you, the pandemic came back where the numbers went higher and so they stopped again. So you kind of do see this start and stop, start and stop approach. There was no formal, like I said, federal shutdown of schools. And so a lot of students across the country actually continued to attend school. Thank you. And uh, this is, a few people have asked this, this is a, probably a more philosophical question, but um, talking about the origination of the Spanish flu and why we still call it the Spanish flu um, when it didn't really originate in Spain, um, and it looks like, mm -hmm. but rather Kansas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we don't know for sure where it came from. Um, Kansas is one theory, although a few people have argued that it actually did not start in Kansas. Some people believe it started in New York. Others still believe it started in Europe. Um, but like I said, it was issues, issues of censorship during World War I because Spain did not uh, prohibit their press um, in any way. And the press freely reported on the number of cases in Spain. Um, the, it looked like that Spain was having a worse time with the Spanish flu than what it actually was. And so that name stuck because it was like, okay, here's Spain is having a hard time with it. The flu must have originated there. And it's like many things, it just stuck and we've never not called it the Spanish flu. Cool, thank you. And um, do you have any information on like, uh, so the question from, uh, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, it's Rainey, um, is asking whether or not Woodrow Wilson downplayed the flu so that it wouldn't be a factor of us getting into World War I. Uh, we were already in World War, they, yes, so yes and no. He did downplay it very much, but we were already in the war at the time. The U.S. was already in the war. So it wasn't to, to um, stop the United States from entering the war. What it really was, as oftentimes happens during war, it was a question of morale and propaganda. And you have to pump up how great the United States is, really. Um, and we see this with World War II, for example, of the propaganda that comes out um, of the United States that creates, uh, that the, the, the propaganda the United States creates. This was also going on during World War I. And so it was more to say, look, the United States is in a great position. We're doing okay. The, the flu isn't impacting us that much, or if it is, it's very minor. And so it was more about um, making sure that the United, that there was still kind of um, the idea that the United States was still doing well and doing well in the war. And so it was that form of propaganda. It wasn't to stop the United States from entering the war. Really interesting, thank you. The next question is just about a vaccine for the Spanish flu. Was there a vaccine? Can you talk about um, mm -hmm. when that occurred, if it did, and information my, about that? Yeah, to my knowledge, there was no formal vaccine for the Spanish flu. I mean, this is in the era before antibiotics, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's for bacteria, but it was, it was, it's in the era before kind of all of that. There was approaches and, and talks about vaccine, and there were kind of, there was, medicine that you could give for the flu, but to my knowledge, there was no formal vaccine for the Spanish flu. And that's why, one reason it was so deadly and why it took so long, it was around two years. And uh, like I said, for it to stop, you either died or you became immune to it. Thank you. And then the last question I'm seeing um, is just uh, about the, the Black Death and why it was called the Black Death. 
Mm -hmm. So we don't actually know that if it was formally called the Black Death at the time. That's something that uh, historians, we kind of could have put that term on. And I should also clarify, and this is something um, that medieval historians are very conscious of, is the way we talk about time periods, these are modern constructions. And so when we say, oh, the Middle, e Middle Ages, people at that time weren't waking up every day going, oh, we're in the Middle Ages. It, that's not how it happened. And so uh, there was oftentimes just called the plague or um, you oftentimes will see it called the bubonic plague as well, which is not entirely accurate because we know the Black Death was also um, a respiratory, there was respiratory transmission as well. And so I don't actually know the origins of why it was called the Black Death, but it was actually called, and it still is called kind of numerous things. And that's one reason historians prefer to call it the second plague pandemic because it really more encompass, encompasses what happens um, and that the entire period was actually longer than what we currently identify. As part of the Black Death, one um, result of that was you would get these kind of spores on your skin and there are notes that perhaps they release some type of black pus. And so there have been connections between calling it and because it was so deadly of calling it the Black Death in connection to these, uh, these spores that you got on your skin. But there, that's kind of also disputed historically as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much.